Hopefully you're recognizing a common theme of what we're going to talk about today. Um, it's, it's one section that I would say when it comes to prayer, it's the one thing that we know we should do, but it's the hardest thing to kind of figure out how to do sometimes. Like, I really want to talk to God, but what am I really going to say to the God of the universe? Uh, when I'm standing face to face in the, in the presence of God, what, what am I going to be able to muster up and say? And unfortunately, when those things hit, our reaction is to then just not pray. To not say anything, to not dive into the presence of God at all. And so as we talk about the Lord's Prayer today, um, I've titled this sermon, What I Want to Pray. And hopefully you find along here that what Jesus is teaching us how to pray is what you really want to say. It's what you really want to pray, but I don't know how to say it. When in doubt, just pray what the scriptures say. Uh, part of the reason that we do the opening scripture from the Psalms is to just pray scripture. It's a powerful practice of sometimes I don't really know what to say, but scripture seems to know what I'm often feeling and what I often need to hear. So I'll just pray that. And it's what Jesus is giving to us in the middle of this section of the religious things, the faithful practices that we have sort of manipulated for our own attention. Last week we talked about giving uh, to the needy and, and serving simply to be seen by other people. Today we're going to look at praying just to be heard and seen by other people. Um, and next week wraps up kind of this section with fasting um, just to be seen by other people. Go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 um, as we get to Jesus' teaching on this prayer. Um, and he's going to start with, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrite. Um, that is primarily because what Jesus is teaching us in all of these things is that the hypocrites love this idea of public faith much more than they do the private devotion. That we would much rather give so somebody sees us giving rather than just giving in secrecy because of mercy and because somebody is in need. We'd much rather pray at the synagogues and in the street corners because people can hear us than to just pray because we want to know God on a deeper level. Right, it says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. And they could actually grammatically also read that they only love to pray once they've found a spot to be seen. They only love to begin praying when they're at the synagogue and in the street corners and they've got somebody's attention. That's when we like to do the whole Jesus thing. And then Jesus utters these perfect words of, Truly I tell you, they've received their reward. You want to be heard by somebody? You want to pray for somebody else to see you and hear you? Fantastic, you got it. But in the same way, if you want to give just to be seen, great, you have their attention. But as we see through all of this, there is the current kind of service that, that leads to the future promise um, and blessing from the Lord. When we do things the way that we are supposed to, according to the word, and in both of these, it's they've got their reward. Great. You want man's approval and attention? Have it, but there's going to be absolutely nothing more to it. And chances are you're going to have to go from synagogue to synagogue, street corner to street corner to keep their attention. Right? What do we love more? The idea of being seen for our faith or the act of actually the private devotion of knowing God. When you pray, 
Jesus gives instructions sort of on how to do this. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. As we're told with the giving of when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Um, as give in secrecy, unknowingly, just to give because of mercy. Uh, there's the reward in that. And Jesus is saying, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door um, and pray to your Father who is in secret. Have a closed-door conversation. Uh, this is not to say that outside of the door, with the door open, that we can't pray. The point is, in all of this, in all of the Sermon on the Mount, I hope you've seen that what Jesus is calling to requires honesty, and it requires a little bit of that, like the dirty work of faith. When you are behind closed doors, that is the honest truth. Right? It's behind the secret doors when the door is closed and we're in our own room, the comfort of our own home, that the reality and the truth of who we are comes out. The most honest conversations we have are the ones behind closed doors. It is absolutely no different. But the place where we go into our room and shut the door, it allows us to be honest before the Lord. And I understand in the point that saying that secret prayer is the honest truth is grammatically redundant. I understand. But Scripture emphasizes this so much when it says salvation is a free gift over and over and over. Gifts are free. Right? We receive them for free. It's like a gift. In the same way, the truth is honest and honesty is the truth. But we've all tried to be honest without really telling the truth. We've tried to blur those lines, and that's exactly what happens in our prayer lives. Well, I'll tell God what I want God to know. I'll tell God what He might see in public. And yet, Jesus is telling us we need to carve out that intentional time and space. Go in your room, shut the door, and get honest. We can only move closer to Jesus from where we really are. We can't fake where we are before God. If you can fake me, you can fool the people around you, but there is certainly one person who you cannot fool. And it just so happens to be the Father who sees in secret. And so when we get into the room, shut the door, pray to our, our Father, then what? That's the part where I think we get tripped up of, well, then what? And then there's a, the, the next point here is, is something I got from a mentor in college, and it's so simple, it makes so much sense. Um, but it changed a lot of things, and just play what you got. Now, you don't need to add to, to any of this. When you pray, don't just keep up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Once again, going back to fooling God is we're not going to be able to verbally please God. There's no verbal manipulation in this. Right? The world knows what is on your heart. If you don't know what to pray, you don't need to create more. Just pray what you have. The second part to that, which I didn't put in there, is pray what you got and shut up. That was what I was really told. That's it. If we just pray what we have, just pray what we can say, pray what we know what we need in the moment, then just stop talking. I will tell you, some of the most transformative prayer that I've had has been completely silent. Where I really just stop talking. Because that's when prayer becomes 
the two-way street and prayer becomes what it is supposed to be. And this whole conversation, the back and forth of us pouring out to the Lord and the Lord pouring back out Himself to us, but the only way we can do it is to pray what we have. To honestly just pray what we got. To pray what's really going on. You know what you need. You know what's weighing on you. You know where you feel like you're falling. You know when you're tired. Pray that. It's hard, like many of the things in Scripture, but sometimes it boils down to a very simple task. Just pray what we have, and then stop talking and be changed. And if we still don't know what to say, Jesus gives us then what we pray as the Lord's Prayer. It is a model for prayer. Each part of it is a piece of what to pray. Right, how, what are the, the steps um, of prayer? And so we're going to walk through each of those. Pray them like this. The first part. Our Father in heaven, I would be your name. Uh, where we have to start in prayer is the fact that God is God and we are not. Uh, because what this does is it removes God as a genie of our lives. God is our servant to do whatever I'm about to say next. By offering just these two words, that our Father in Heaven, hallowed be your name. That our Father in Heaven, it's this whole idea of the word transcendence, meaning God sits outside of time. He sits outside of the natural world. He is the one who created all of this. God is not the world. The world is not God. Two separate things. Right? God sits and transcends outside of this natural world, meaning He truly alone is God. Step number one, recognize God as God. As the creator and sustainer of all things. And we get to how it be your name. It comes from the Greek word Hagiazo, which is to consecrate something or to set apart. Right, so, and just as much our Father in Heaven is setting God apart from the world, setting Him apart as the Creator, to pray how would be your name is to recognize and to begin to uphold the weight and the holiness of God's name. This becomes difficult in a way because the name of God, the name of Jesus, has become like mere table conversation. Uh, we say the name of Jesus and we're like, we're not really moved. Uh, we pray the holiness of God and we're not really moved. When's the last time that we considered the weight of the name of Jesus? That is, I shared right at the end of last week what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2 that the whole mission of, of everything in Scripture is to save the souls of sinners who need to come to repentance. But that the final part of Philippians chapter 2 in the mindset of Jesus and mimicking that is in the end, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. And yet, we just fling the name of Jesus and the name of God around like it's everything else. To get into prayer is we have to set apart the name of God from every other name that we confess. There's a reason we don't pray to anything else in this world. There's a reason that we pray to God because He is truly holy and is truly set apart. 
that our posture into prayer has to begin there. As setting Him apart alone. Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. This is one that we pray a lot without realizing it, and it sounds something like this, and it says, Jesus, if you're ready, come on back. All right, Jesus, come soon, please. Uh, your kingdom come is talking about the, the physical reign of the kingdom of heaven that's going to be established in the end. When have we seriously prayed for final victory? That we jokingly, semi-heartedly say, Jesus, come back. But are we really ready? Are we really praying for Christ to return? To pray your kingdom come, three simple words, holds a lot of weight in talking of the final victory of God. Lord, come establish your reign here on earth. Come in the final victory, proving to the world that you alone are God. The first two steps of this, hopefully what you've seen, have nothing to do with us. You and I are not in that. But the first step in prayer is reminding ourselves who God is and telling and worshiping God for who He is. That He is the one who is set apart, that He is the beginning of all things, that His kingdom is going to come to establish the end of all things and into eternity. Right, so we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, the hard one, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. There's two pieces to this. But that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The, we, we looked at this, like the whole idea of the mission of God, our mission as the church then is to, to save Souls to bring sinners into repentance for the, to seek and to save the lost as Christ came to do. The whole purpose of that is the glory of God. But read Genesis that creation happened to glorify God. You and I were created to glorify the Lord and uphold the holiness and perfection of creation. And so, allowing the Lord's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven is that you and I desire the holiness of God, that you and I go to act in everything for the glory of God, that that is what is spread. The will of God is the glory of God through Christ. And the second piece to that is in a way that you and I do what we're supposed to do. That God's glory is spread, and then the people who receive God's glory through Christ then actually live into that. That the true will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that you and I obey the word of God and are in active pursuit of to know and to share the glory of God. The first three parts of this. God is God. God's coming again. And I want to know God deeper. That's where prayer really needs 
to start. But here's what happens. Because right, we're going to get into the give us today our daily bread. Right, forgive us. Forgive me. Right, and keep me from temptation. We skip those. We skip the whole God and prayer part and go directly to the this is what I need. Please forgive me and save me and keep me all the days of my life. Amen. See you in a week. And we wonder why nothing seems to change. We wonder why, like, did God really answer my prayer? But it's because we've missed the whole God part in prayer. Like, circle, bold, highlight, uh, whatever you need to do to remind yourselves of, like, prayer needs to start with us recognizing that God is God. He's coming again. And our ultimate desire and posture needs to be, I want to know Jesus more. When we get there is when we begin to see the fruit then of what comes next, which is to request like what we need. There is a part of prayer where you say, God, this is what I need. I don't think, I think we all get that part. But it's not just, God, here's what I need to live comfortably. Here's what I need you to do for me to live my ideal life. It's the prayer that give us this day our daily bread. Bread was the foundational nutrient necessary for survival. Uh, it was, at this time, bread was like, we don't have bread. We're in some deep trouble. We need to pray not only for what we want God to do. We need to pray for God to intervene and give us what we desperately need. What we need for survival. Not just what we want. And here's the beautiful piece of this. He says, give us this day, give us today. Which means... You're going to have to come back tomorrow. Okay, give us today our daily bread. We come back tomorrow and say, God, give us today our daily bread. That each and every day, we need to come back to the Lord alone for survival. Now, why did God get mad at the Israelites? It's because they were trying to store so much, so much manna for multiple days. So they didn't have to come back day after day relying on the Lord to fulfill His word and provision. Welcome to what we try and do. Like, give us today our daily bread. God, give me what I need for today, and I know I will come back tomorrow because you already know what I need for tomorrow. Like, but Jesus is going to tell us in a few short verses for us here in the now in a couple weeks. Right, when we get there, but not to worry about tomorrow, for today has enough worries of its own. Don't pray for your bread tomorrow, because you're going to need something for today. Like, give us today our daily bread. Jesus says in, in the Gospel of John that he is the bread of life. Like, give us Jesus today. Right, we request God's provision. We need God. We pray to Him for what we need in this life today. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, there is a small little break in the passage. Of structurally, it's the Lord's Prayer is like six phrases um, of kind of what we're framework, which runs through the, the forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, then goes into lead us not into temptation, but deliver us uh, from the evil one. Those are the six. And then verses 14 and 15, we get a little bit of an explanation on the fifth one. 
All right, so that's kind of why it's set up like this. Well, so in receiving and praying for God's forgiveness, uh, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And Jesus goes on to explain that if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. Uh, in the same way of receiving our daily bread kind of implies and requires us to come back tomorrow, in the same way of understanding and receiving God's forgiveness should and necessarily implies that we then are forgiving other people. Because if we've understood the forgiveness that has been given to us in Christ, that if God can forgive me, then I've got every reason to forgive that person. The ebbs and flows, some of these things correlate to one another. Understanding our forgiveness in God should have a direct positive correlation to how we forgive other people. But and there are implications to that. But if you are forgiven, go and forgive. But go and make reconciliation. The part being here that we have to pray for the forgiveness of other people. Listen, it's really easy, and I'm probably very guilty of it at times, of, Lord, forgive me. And that whole forgiveness piece stops there. Lord, forgive me, but I'll take care of forgiving all those other people. Or not forgiving them. I'll take care of judging whether they deserve Forgiveness or not. By part of receiving God's forgiveness is allowing the other people around us to also receive the forgiveness. In the last piece, the perfect flow to all of this is we start with God and we end with God and we just end up somewhere in the middle. That's kind of how all of creation is going to go. It starts with God. You and I show up. And it's going to end with the full reign of of God. And so we set the name of God apart. We profess that He is God alone. Jesus, come back and establish your final victory in your reign. I want to know God more. That is the desire of my heart is to know you intimately and personally. God, this is what I need. Forgive me as I forgive other people. And Lord Jesus, save me. When's the last time we actually prayed for deliverance? And meant it. And believed in it. And trusted in it. But in the, the Beatitudes study this week, it we're looking through, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And one of the questions, I put it on there as a reflection question, but one of the things of sitting in that, with that all week, was do you believe Jesus can overcome you? Do you believe God can save you? Do you really believe that Jesus can transform you. Do you really believe that you can be free from sin? Do you really believe that the power of God is stronger than the power of evil and the power of Satan? Has Christ actually overcome Satan? All those questions that the answer is one word and it's yes. Right, that when we trust in God's deliverance, this isn't, please, like, sometimes I, I think about what I'm about to say, and this is one of those instances of, it's not praying for God's deliverance. It's trusting 
that he hasn't already defeated sin. He has already delivered us from the hands of Satan as we look back on it. Right? As in this moment, Jesus, as the earthly human being, is on his way to the cross. Right? At the end of the Gospel of Matthew. But for them to be holy, to deliver them from the evil one, you and I now have the track record of Satan being squashed under the foot of Jesus. And yet you and I need to continue to trust in this and pray for this very thing. Because the question can come up that if Jesus has already defeated Satan, why do I actually need to pray this? Take you back to the second point of Jesus comes faster so we can truly experience this. But that the power of Satan is still running amok on this earth. And hopefully I don't have to tell you that. But, you and I need to pray this because it is detrimental when we don't. If you and I are not praying about Jesus, Lord, keep me from temptation, we're done. The battle's lost. Lord, if we're not praying, deliver me from the power of Satan, we're done. We don't pray this, we're going to keep sinning. We're going to keep giving into. Temptation. We're going to keep living under the reign of Satan. Because if we don't do this with the Lord's help, we're done. You and I are never on our own power going to be able to muster up enough strength, enough courage, enough discipline to not give in to ourselves. We're going to trust our own ability to get us out of the mess that our own ability got us into in the first place. We need to trust in the Lord's deliverance of what he has already done in the cross and the empty tomb, what is going to be coming in the end times and the final establishment of the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and every step in between is the Spirit is there to guide you and to transform you, to keep you from the power of Satan. That you can truly be transformed and delivered now. And unfortunately, I don't think we always believe that. I don't think we always trust that the Lord has power now. That deliverance is possible Today. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We need the Lord. And if we want to be transformed, we want to be delivered. If our honest prayer was, God, this is where I'm at and I really don't want to be here. Or, we just retrospectively take a look at our lives and go, I wish things were a little different. But I wish things were not what they used or were not what they are. Prayer is the absolute igniter to these things. The great leaders and great faithful people of Scripture you're going to find a common characteristic that says that we're all pretty good at prayer. But the great leaders in Scripture were great at prayer. Abraham, Moses, Daniel, David, Jesus, Paul, Peter. All pretty good at prayer. But there's always this common discipline. It really shouldn't be a surprise that the great leaders of God's kingdom are the ones who spend the most time trying to usher in and spend into the presence of God and His kingdom. It has to start with prayer. If you want something to be different with your faith, it has to start with prayer. If you want God to do something, you've got to start with God. But the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sin, he will be 
forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. This is from the letter of James. What is, what's he really getting at? Two simple words. Prayer works. But the prayer of faith can heal the one who is sick. The prayer of faith can lead to forgiveness. The prayer of a righteous person, the prayer of one who has been made right with God, has great power. The miracle is ushered in through prayer. It is the igniter to change. It is the igniter to transformation. It is the foundational piece for your faith to be different. Paul writes in, in Philippians chapter 4, But rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Matthew chapter 4, the first words of Jesus, right, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The Lord is at hand. But do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. We need something to change. We wish we weren't stuck in something. The answer seems to be prayer. I let your request be made known to God. What is the result of prayer? What is the result of laying your life in the presence of God? The peace of God. What do we really want? We just want peace. Peace in our heart, peace in our minds, peace amongst one another. But most notably, peace with ourselves. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil ones. It's the peace of God. It is trusting God's deliverance that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Now, at the end of the armor of God, now when Paul in Ephesians lays out, pick up the full armor of God, not for you to go attack everybody, but to defend yourself. The whole point is that when Satan comes, when the evil forces of this world come, you are ready to stand again. You are ready to stand firm. And at the end, when talking with the sword of the Spirit, by praying at all times in the Spirit, right, with prayer and supplication, to the end time, keep a light with perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me. I pray for yourselves and pray for other people. The armor of God ends with prayer. To pray for ourselves and our perseverance, to pray on behalf of all of the other saints, of the other believers, of the other people in this world. And it says to pray for Paul himself. And to pray for you and I, ourselves, so that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. But pray for Paul so that while he's in prison, he can continue to speak boldly. While he's been in prison because of the gospel, pray for him to continue to speak the gospel. Why do we need to continue to pray if we've received the gospel? That you and I continue to ignite the passion that we have for Christ, the urgency that we have to share the gospel. Every part of your faith and steps forward, everything that is in this book is sustained by prayer. It's like the number one characteristic of what we would call the good Christians and the not-so-good Christians. If we even begin to draw those 
lines and subconsciously we do. The key characteristic is prayer. Because it leads us to one necessity. That you and I just lay our lives down at the feet of Jesus. Entering into prayer. What we really want to pray is just, Lord, here I am, and I need you. And sometimes prayer can be that simple because the Lord already knows what we need before we even speak it. This is in the book of Second Chronicles. Now, the Lord and Solomon, as the, the kingdom is beginning to not be the kingdom that was once established. As the Lord says to him, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. When the the bad things that we experience here on earth. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. My people who are called by a name that is set apart and pray to the Lord, desire His holiness and provision, turn from their wicked ways, ask for forgiveness and turn from the evil one, that He will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal the land. His eyes will be opened and His ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. If you and I are willing to come to an end of ourselves before the Lord, truly set Him apart as God, desire to know Him and Him alone, ask for forgiveness, repent of our sin and go in faith, It's the heart of the gospel. And it's the greatest promise that we have in Scripture, one of them, is that when we turn to God, He's waiting there having already turned back to us. If that is the heart of the gospel, it's what the cross and the empty tomb are all about. It's why the resurrection is so beautifully important, that when you and I need to turn back to the Lord, we're not trying to recapture the Lord's attention. We're not trying to recapture and reignite His love. He's standing there having already turned back to us. I tell you in, in his first letter in First Thessalonians, that rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What is the will of God? That you find joy, pray to the Lord alone, and give thanks to God. It's almost like the will of God is for you to know God in Christ Jesus. And so don't quench the Spirit. When we stop praying, we quench the work of the Holy Spirit. When we stop praying, we get rid of the work of God in us. We turn from God and then go, God, why aren't you doing anything? I don't despise prophecies, but test everything. I hold fast to what is good, abstain from every evil. Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely. The Jews always pray at that season, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? That the God of peace may sanctify you completely. That the God of peace might transform you completely. That your whole spirit and soul and body 
be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. That you might just turn back and God will make you into exactly who he created you to be. That the God of peace fills you to what you are searching for. That your heart becomes fully satisfied and you are free from the power and the presence of sin. And the promise in all of this that he who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. If I receive the gift of salvation, I've alluded to it, the whole, your kingdom come, the kingdom is coming. We're getting closer every day. The kingdom is coming. That one day, you and I will stand in the presence of the Lord, perfectly sanctified, perfectly free from sin. That the deliverance and the final victory of God is going to be ushered in, and we will reign with God forever. We will be His people. He will be our God. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. The Son of God came and said he was going to be crucified, buried in a tomb, and rise on three days. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. And he did. He said, the kingdom is coming. Is that what we are praying for? Is your Christianity marked by Christ? Is your prayer marked by Jesus? In fact, you can't really give a sermon on prayer and not talk about Jesus' prayer in the garden. What is the Lord's prayer summed up in about a sentence? My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Lord, you and your will are set apart from you in the heavens as the glorious God than where I find myself here on earth. Right. Jesus' desire is for the will of God to be done in perfect holiness. There is a cup that he is asked to be taken from him if there is any other way. And yet the submission of faith is any way your will be done. This is a prayer that is going to lead to the greatest forgiveness and trusting in when Jesus drinks this cup that the will of the Father is going to be done is to trust wholeheartedly, completely in the deliverance that is coming on the cross. Jesus' prayer life was marked by the Father. Everything he did was marked by the glory that was going to come to the Father, that the Father then returns to Christ the Son in heaven. Is really what we're doing marked by Jesus? Are we going into the hills to pray? Will you join me in prayer? Lord, your eyes are on us at all times. Your eyes, your ears, your hearts are turned towards your children that have turned back to you. You're standing there with open arms, wanting us to just run and be in your presence to know you. The Hebrew tells us it's a throne of grace and mercy. That you are forgiving, that you are the God of all gods, you are the Lord of all gods, the King of all kings. In your presence, in a moment of prayer, we trust that you alone are God. Jesus, we are ready for you to come back, for your kingdom to be established. We desire to know you wholeheartedly, to know nothing but the glory and perfection of Christ. We need 
forgiveness. That we confess in prayer all the times that we haven't prayed. All the times that we've left you out of our prayers. As we have been forgiven, may we go and forgive others. And God, in absolutely all things, we trust in your deliverance. We trust that you are the way, the truth, and the life, the only path to the glorious gift of salvation. That you have defeated Satan, you have defeated the power of sin and death, you've defeated the grave that we do not have to fear, but we can rest knowing our Prince of Peace, the God of Peace, is with us and working God, we close the door. We sit with you alone. We open the doors to our heart. We give you the honest truth of where we are, who we are. And we allow ourselves to simply just receive your spirit, your salvation, your goodness, your blessing, your provision. We receive you. God, we don't have to keep up anything special. We sit in your presence and when we don't know what to say, we turn to what Jesus has given to us. We pray what he he taught his disciples to pray as our congregation. Lord, we pray together this prayer. Our Father, who is art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.